morning to you this morning and welcome here to Forest Heights Baptist Church at 804 Tanger Drive, Fort Walton Beach, Florida. Come on out and join us anytime you can. We'd be uh, glad to have you and you're welcome to come out and join us on Sunday mornings at 11 o'clock for worship service, 10 o'clock for Sunday school, Bible study, and uh, then again at 5 for our Bible study at Sunday night. So come on out and join us if you can. Thank you if you've joined us by uh, video on YouTube. Thank you for that and appreciate that. And uh, I hope the Lord is blessing you. Uh, we are beginning this Sunday a new uh, book in the Bible. We finished up Galatians in the New Testament and we are jumping back to the Old Testament now uh, to the book of 1 Samuel, the book of 1 Samuel in the Old Testament. So if you'll turn there with me, uh, we'll uh, take up the uh, first three verses this morning and an introduction to the book. Uh, and I always like to try to do an introduction to kind of give the background, the setting, and some of those general ideas so we have some idea of where it's coming from when we read it, give us some context. So this morning, uh, reading from 1 Samuel, verse 1, there was a certain man from Ramathim, a Zuphite, from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Joram, and son of Elihu, and son of Tohu, and son of Zuth, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Peniah. Peniah had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from the town uh, to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Now, I was reading from the NIV, and I'll uh, stay with that as I've been doing lately. Uh, so the most uh, difficult uh, books in the Old Testament in the original language Hebrew to uh, translate and uh, what uh, happens is, as we go along, different translations of the Bible in English have different uh, sources that they use sometimes, and different, those sources are all translations. Uh, we don't have any of the original documents uh, ever. The, new, the most recent document we have that gives some insight into Samuel as far as the original language is the, uh, the, some of the Dead Sea Scrolls. There were pieces and fragments of First Samuel. Uh, most of the time, your King James Version, New King James Version, a few of those will go with what's called the Masoretic Text. Don't memorize that. doesn't worry. And, uh, and then the NIV will look, uh, and some of the newer uh, translations uh, in the last 30, 40 years, uh, and so would look at other texts as well. So, uh, so there might be some differences in the word. I'll try to point them out. First thing you see there is that his, uh, from this town of Ramath Ramathaim, and, uh, and you will notice that that's what it says here. Yours will probably say Romathahim, uh, Zufahim, Zufim, or Zophim. Uh, and that's just a, that's, uh, I'll explain that in just a minute. And yours might say from the hill country of Ephraim, that's what mine says, or it might say in Ephathrathite. And I'll explain that to you in a minute too. Uh, but uh, if you find something different, if you have access to online uh, sources, you may look at, a few other translations just to see what the differences are. If and I'll try to point out anything significant, I just wanted to say that right up front. Uh, and in the original Hebrew, and by the way, most of the translations we have and the most are going by the Septuagint. The Septuagint, as you remember, was a a, a Greek translation of the Old Hebrew that happened around uh, 200 BC. Uh, that was about the newest one that we have of it. So, so even at that point in time, the original languages were basically uh, disappearing, uh, the original Hebrew, and the people uh, translated into Greek because it was a predominant language at the time. And so we had this thing you've heard of called the Septuagint, or if you see it abbreviated, it's LXX, capital letters, right? So it means the 70, but anyhow. Uh, the point is, so there's, that's where it is. It's not somebody doesn't know or anything like that, or there's you know, some arguments about it. They're just minor things that we, I think we'll try out along. Other interesting thing is that First and Second Samuel uh, were one book, okay? One book, one continuous thing. And uh, ever, since the, uh, ever since the Septuagint, we've divided them into two books. And a uh, question about why is that? Well, likely that they rolled, they wrote everything on scrolls. That was a you know rolled up thing. 
And a scroll was made up of some material that it was limited as to how big of a one you could carry around or get on something, a scroll, and they figured out about what they wanted to do. And so just like in the New Testament, uh, Luke and Acts are basically the same thing, the same book written by the same person, Luke. Uh, they divide them up partly, uh, mostly because of the size of the, of, the, of the document. When they wrote it all down, and got to the end pretty much that's where that's as far as they could go so they decided that two scrolls was easier to handle than one scroll and so first and second same just something to, to let you know about there uh, um, who wrote this well nobody really knows exactly we know that Samuel is mentioned in it but um, he writes some of it probably but is a typical for this type of literature in that time frame and because of some of the events that are mentioned in both the first and second Samuel, it's clear that these were written, uh, these historical books, and certainly this one was written by many other or several other or a few other. And I'll say that because nobody knows exactly how many uh, Hebrew historians, people who were careful and uh, to keep track of what was said by Samuel at various times and the facts that went along with that. Uh, and to tie these things together. So uh, do not go to seed over any of this stuff. When you hear stuff like this, people sometimes do backflips and they start, you know, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. Understand this, all of the, this is of the uh, word of God and all of it is God's authorship and all of it has what God wants in it uh, as he directed it and wanted it to be. And so even the people who translated it all along were doing it under God's guidance and care and, and we don't want to spend a lot of time, but there, I did, if you could just imagine the diligence that went into this because the people who were handling these things, uh, trying to put them in, uh, keep track of them and, re and just copy them and then to translate them, were well aware of the God of the universe and to make no uh, errors and to be careful about it. So when is the time? What time in history uh, chronologically did these things take place? Pretty much uh, can't say for sure the exact date of the writing because it's spread out over time, but the dates between two times because of events that are mentioned, uh, 931 BC and then all the way up to 722 BC, uh, you know, somewhere maybe 150 years. Uh, I think Samuel was born around 1120 BC, uh, but, uh, but we don't know exactly. Those dates don't always line up. Nobody knows. It's not particularly uh, important about that, but we do understand that Samuel uh, did keep track of it, did know about the death of David as a kind of a beginning point, if you will. That happened around 971. So uh, there it is. Now, what's the setting? Uh, what, what was the cultural setting? What was the um, uh, political setting? Uh, as you know, Samuel came, he, he bridges a gap, if you will, and the period of the judges, which lasted about 300 years, uh, ends up being basically the last one of those. And I'll, point, I'll say a little bit more about that. And during that time, the, the, the people of God deteriorated. They became apostatized. In other words, they became, you know, totally outside of God. They went off and drifted off in different ways. And we find that even the priesthood was, was affected by this. As we, as you, as I mentioned in verse three, as we're here in scripture, the sons of Eli were Phineas and Hophni, and uh, and so, uh, and those two were about as corrupt and as uh, uh, polluted as you could possibly be to have the job they had, and uh, so uh, also, uh, that, so that's going to be important. We'll talk about that a little bit, and you, we'll get into that a little more as it gets in time. But I want you to get the idea here into Samuel. This is where people of Israel ask for a king, which is important, okay? It's an important. And that leads us to, if that will, it leads us quickly uh, to uh, the purpose of the book. What's the point of this, right? Well, of course, uh, God is uh, reviewing the history of Israel over two or three hundred year period, a couple hundred years anyway. And the, the big picture here, which is a big picture, is the sovereignty of God. God is establishing he already is sovereign. It's not about whether God is sovereign or isn't sovereign. What is important, and that's all that remains important today, is that we agree with that, that we understand the sovereignty of God and accept that into our life and, and what all that means. And, and so 
this was a problem then. It's a problem in between then and now. And it's a problem now. And I suspect it will be a problem. This, God is sovereign over everything. And God is going to move from the time of the judges uh, and into a time of the prophets. Right. And Samuel stands with a foot in both times. He is the bridge, if you will, from the judges to the prophets. And uh, and he also is that person who is going to set up this through God's set it up through him. The king, they had no king up until then. And now he's going to give them a king. And this king, of course, we know as Saul. We'll see more about that as we go through the book. And it ends up being David, right? It falls with David. Paul, David was the greatest king and the last king and the best king and the highest king, if you will, of course, is Jesus Christ. And so he becomes the perfect, permanent, final king. So we, we see God working in history to show his sovereignty over every aspect of life, over the politics, over the over the religious practices, over the, over the sin of the world and all that that means and all those kind of things. And God is trying to show people this idea about his word. And Samuel stands there in this kind of gap, if you will. He becomes this transitional figure that, uh, that says that you need to be obedient to God. That you absolutely must be obedient to God. The king must be obedient to God. And the prophets have to be obedient to God. And the only way you're going to have acceptance of God is to be obedient to him. And so this becomes important. That's why Jesus come and Jesus said that, you know, you have to be obedient to me. You have to do what I do. I did what the father wanted and you have to do that too. And so all the way through, all the way, including the death on the cross, this becomes important as an act of obedience. So, so Samuel is that, that bridge character, that guy in between, Right thing we can say out this, how are we going to connect the dots here, Robbie, before I lose everybody? Well, one of the things I'm going to say is family matters. Family matters. Do not under, uh, underestimate, and I know that the world talks about it, but guess what? Family matters, and how the family handles things matters. And we see here this guy, it starts off with a certain man. Now, Raphaim is Rama. You'll see it in the Bible, other places. Now, Rama is a common fairly common name, so it's used of a few different places, but this is Rama. He says he's cut from here. It says here in the NIV, he's from the hill country of Ephraim. In Ephraim, and by the way, uh, this idea that he's in uh, Rama is two hills. Okay, that's what the word kind of means. It means two hills, means hill country, two hills. So he's from the two hill country, right? And so uh, his Big area is Ephraim, Ephraim, right? I've heard of that. But the smaller area in there would be known as Epathra. Does that sound familiar to you? Has anybody thought about that? That's why it might have a different word in yours for instead of Ephraim, you have Epathra, right? And so because of that, uh, it's the same place. And by the way, guess what else is in Epathra? If you haven't remembered what else that stood for, Bethlehem. Does that ring a bell? Right? Because Elkanah lived several miles away from Shiloh, where they ended up going to worship, and he uh, took his family there. He took his family there to worship. That was a big operation to load up the kids, the wives, and enough provisions to go, not just to travel, but to stay and to do the sacrifices was a big deal. So his dad, Samuel's dad, was a faithful man who was trying to do what needed to be done. He wanted to go there to worship. And as a Levite, as a descendant of the Levites, he was required three times a year, but he didn't have to take his family every time, but he took them at least once, we know that. The other two times he may have went there to serve or he may have went by himself. It wasn't, it wasn't something that they necessarily had to take his family, but he took the time and opportunity to take his family to worship. I can't tell you how important that is. How important that is to go to worship it, that you get involved. Parents are very important. That's why we have a generation of people that are that are turning away from the church because a lot of that generation, not all of them, but a lot of them, parents had nothing to do with it. They are fishing, golfing, boating, hunting, doing whatever they wanted to do, and they couldn't get their kids to church, wouldn't take them. Now that just, like I said, that's not everyone. 
But as many of them, look at this guy, Samuel's dad. Samuel's dad's wife, who we will learn a little along the way, Hannah, the first wife, that's how I know she was first because she didn't have any children. So he got the second one to try to get some children. Hannah uh, was not put out, not sent away, not left on her own, which he could have done. But he kept her with him. And we're going to learn that he loved her the most and he really, that's who he loved. But guess what? He kept her with him because he honored her and he had a uh, he felt like it was the right thing to do it was should have taken care of her he married her he should take care of her and he did and he brought her along to worship also and he gives her we will read it down the road here that he gives her uh, uh, stuff to work to sacrifice and not just a little bit and so this is the dad of Samuel a man who led his family at his own expense, at great expense, of course, to the church. Made sure they went to what we call a church. Went to this temple. Went to Shiloh. They went there. He made sure that they had what was taken. He did the appropriate things. And he had a wife who was childless, which was a very big deal. And yet he kept her rather than putting her away. He kept her and he took care of her. And he also made sure she went to worship. And uh, of course, uh, anytime there's two wives, uh, there's always trouble. And we'll see down the road there will be trouble. However, he was faithful to this part. He was The important thing I want to get is this guy, Elkanah, Samuel's dad, had already started a pattern. He'd already established a pattern. And listen, I don't know where you are on that continuum or where the... Uh, are just starting out or you are down the road listen it's no never too late to start okay if you haven't had the right pattern if you haven't done the right thing start don't say well you know i've done i went 20 years i haven't done uh, no point in starting now no that's not a good idea start doing the right thing if we had the if we had more people parents who were uh faithful to god and faithful to their family to take them and insist i think we'd be in a different place but guess what Whenever you do the right thing, God honors that. Just like when the wrong thing comes along, there's consequences. He led his family. Family matters. Samuel's family uh, mattered. And they, they, even before Samuel comes along, there is this history, this pattern that's established. And so family matters. The second thing I see here is that worship matters because after, as I said, he takes them to worship. This is a big deal. I mean, nowadays there's a church on every corner, I guess still, you know, they're disappearing quick, but they're on every corner. People can go. It's easy to get there. You don't have to go too far. Like I said, in my day, there was a bus that came around and took us. Uh, you have relatives that might pick you up, take you. There's things like that. But he went out of his way. He spent, a, it was a very costly thing to go. Nowadays, people won't even go when it when it's when it's as easy as pie, they won't even turn on the YouTube and watch it, <laughs> right? They won't even do that. It's too much bother to them, right? I mean, I, I'm fascinated by, you know, you can't. It, it just proves a point. They didn't want to worship anyway. They wanted to do it. Here, he takes a lot of effort to do. He travels his whole family. He goes to Shiloh. Now Shiloh is where the Ark of the Covenant is at this time. Shiloh is a place where they went to worship. He thought it was important to go there and worship. He took his whole family. You see, the reason people don't come to worship, the reason people don't participate is because it's not important. I, you don't have to be a rocket scientist, a psychologist, or any other kind of person. What we do is what is important, period. Uh, said there's two things in life, urgent things and important things. Unfortunately, sometimes people get the, get, don't really get those mixed up. You know, they don't know what's, what's the difference between urgent and important. If you get, sometimes if you get the important things right, some of those things you thought were urgent are not as urgent as they were. <laughs> you thought about that? Do you think that Elkanah and his wife, two wives and his children, didn't have stuff to do at the house? They didn't have crops and they didn't have 
livestock. They didn't have, you know, dusting and cleaning and, you know, and day-to-day -day opportunities and stuff like that, things they had to do that we all have to do. They didn't have something to do. Sure they did. They stopped and they went to worship. And Elkanah was the head of the household and he took them with him and he provided all that was necessary for them to be able to make the trip and to have something when they got there. Not only did he bring physical things to worship, but his attitude clearly because of the, all the complications and things, if you think about this, his attitude was one that he needed to go. He wanted to go. He felt it was the right thing to do, which leads me to the last thing, which is sacrifice. Sacrifice. Family matters, worship matters, and sacrifice matters. It was a sacrifice for him to go. He did not come to God's temple, which was several miles away, 10, 20, 30 miles, something like that away from where he lived. He didn't come there empty handed. He came there to bring the appropriate sacrifice, what was called for. He brought that for his two wives. Did he have to? No. He brought that for his children. Did he have to? No. But it was what was called for and what it should have done. It should be done. Time, he, uh, God is looking at this. God had a plan way a long time ago in the beginning, the Bible says. He had a plan to raise up people, to raise up individuals, and to call people out and to say, listen, I'm God, and there is no other one beside me, and I have some demands that I'm making, and I expect you to follow them, and I'm going to make you see how this works, and if you'll go along with the program, it's going to be smooth. If it, you don't, it won't. And so uh, the sacrifice, uh, what's the sacrifice? Well, doing what I think is thing do it instead of what God wants. I sacrifice my way, my ideas, my thoughts to what God wants, which means you need to think that God exists and you need to think that God has an opinion about it. He has something to say about it, if you will, and that his is the only one that counts. Again, trouble. 21st century people do not like that. They don't like God. They don't like the sovereignty of God. They don't like the fact that God asked us to do what he wants us to do, not what we just want to do ourselves. They don't like that, so they rebel against that, and, and ultimately they cancel God, to use the term, right? They've been canceling God for a long time ago. He's still around. He's still in charge. You know, all you're doing is canceling yourself. <laughs> I mean, that's what happens. The people of God, remember now, these were the people that God had called out this, and they had, had he had given them judges to lead them. And these judges tried to lead them and tried to do it, but didn't work. They wouldn't listen to them. They turned off. Even the priests, Hophni and Phinehas, become corrupted. And all of this time before Samuel came along, there was all this corruption and uh, filthiness and just everything you could think of and imagine, uh, you know, that could be done wrong. They were doing it and they weren't just doing it over in the corner in the dark. As it says. So said, they were doing it in front of the priest and they were going along with it. So this is what happens. This is how society is. This is the way it is today. I want to live this lifestyle. I want to do this. I want to do that. But God don't want that. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll just say, well, it don't matter what God wants. I won't sacrifice my own will for God's. Won't do it. Some people come to church, say, well, oh, Lord, Brother Robbie, I don't do this thing, that thing, these things that, you know, oh, I don't do those. But I, I don't really believe that God, uh, you know, that I need to give anything or do anything or sacrifice anything. This is a this has op, op, uh, application today. People say, "Well, and I've heard it for a long time." Oh, they're hypocrites down there at that church. They're all hypocrites. Well, yeah, okay, we're all hypocrites. There's a bunch of sinners down at the church. Yeah, okay, are we're all sinners, right? <laughs> that the church people they're no better than anybody else. Okay. That preacher, he's whacked out, you know, down there. May be true. Sometimes we are, right? I mean, not just in a funny way, but, a, you know, a terrible way. We've read about that. We read about that all the time. So I'm just going to quit this whole God thing because of so-and-so or a whole bunch of so-and-sos or this preacher, that preacher, 
this denomination or that denomination, this thing or that. I'm going to just quit. Look to me. Where people say, well, the church is corrupt. Okay. And, you, you know, you can say, okay. And they'll look at you like, well, that's the reason I don't. What about God? You think God's corrupt? I said, because you got people that don't do their job at your business that make you, uh, you know, you mean you're not doing yours? You know, if you've got, you've got people that won't follow you, won't do what they're supposed to do, does that mean the leader's wrong? And that's in a man, manly sort of way, human sort of way. The fact of the matter is, God is never wrong. He's sovereign, and so he hasn't lost his sovereignty because people are acting up or doing these terrible things. And at least, whatever the case might be with Elkanah, he took his family to worship God regardless of what was going on in, in, the, in the priesthood or the religious practices, if you want to call it the institution of the church. I hear that all the time. Uh, it's an institution. I don't, you know, I don't follow institutions. Good. Do you follow God? What's his word say? Well, I don't read that. Well, how do you know what he says? Well, you find out when you ask people that don't read God's word, don't in, are not interested in finding out what God says, that the reason they're not interested is because then they will be accountable to God. So if you don't know what God says, you can make him say anything you want to. If you don't know what God says, then anybody else can tell you he says anything he wants to and you agree with it. You want a God of your own making. You don't want the sovereign God who's over everything, who can work out stuff that nobody else can. And I had no children. You know, Sarah didn't have no children. She was 90-something years old. I mean, you know, stuff like that. Work it out. God hears the faithful. God hears the faithful. Year after year, he went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas were two of Eli's sons. Now, I mentioned their names. You have, if you haven't read Samuel, you don't know the rest of the story. Elkanah was a great family man. <laughs> Isn't this ironic how this works? Eli lets his sons do anything they want to. Elkanah said, load yourself up. We're going up to the worship. Eli couldn't get his, he wouldn't even condemn his sons when they were doing stuff. And it ends up badly for him, as you, as you might know. Or if you don't, we'll read about it later on down the road of ways. But the fact of the matter is, this is God says, i got, I got to do something different. I'm going to need to have someone. Prophet. A new thing. Samuel didn't come into his job because he was a Levite. He came into his job because he was called by God. He crossed over. He becomes the first one of the prophets that, that are specifically called out to be prophets. He faithful to God because God called him, not because he was a Levite, although there was nothing wrong with that. Not because of that, not because he was appointed a judge. He was the guy in the middle. He bridged the gap. He was given the job of God to, to announce to other people. He was a kingmaker, if you will, in God's hand. When you are faithful to God and you trust God, you can do great things. You can do some great things. Something else I'll point out to you that may have been obscured in verse 3. You may see there in this translation it says Lord Almighty. And you may see the Lord God of the host or something like that. Let me point out something to you. This is as he went to the Lord Almighty. This word becomes a new word that we use associated with God. The idea to describe God as enormous, bigger than anything. In other words, he's the Highest of highs, he encompasses everything. Nothing is bigger than him. None of these pagan gods, none of the armies that you're going to face, none of the problems that you'll face in your life are bigger than God. It's important. We don't like to, uh, this is a problem I think a lot of people have when it comes to worshiping sacrifices. They haven't found the big God, as I call it. Pardon me for using a simple word. But the big God, the God is so big that all the things you can imagine, there's nothing he can't do. There's nothing he doesn't know. Know where he can't be. Know where he's not. See, my God's not stuck in a tree, so I don't worship trees. He's not stuck in a rock. I don't worship rocks. 
He's not stuck in a chair, a building, a place, a geography, a location. He's not stuck in any of that stuff. I don't have that God. My God is so much bigger than all that, that all of that he made. So he's bigger than that. My God is not limited in knowledge to mathematics. And science. I don't have to tell, have a scientist explain to me how God is. <laughs> I mean, scientists, knows, they can explain some cool stuff. And, and I don't need a mathematician to calculate the size of God because he's incalculable. Matter of fact, all the math that we know and ever will know, all the science, whatever that means, we know and will ever know, God already knows all that stuff. He, he's the reason there is anything to study or count. Whatever I didn't know. this I know you all have been around me, know me. That's a big deal to me. Whatever I wanted, I want to know stuff. That was always my motivator. I had to know, know, know. I lived in a library and stuff like that. It's hard to tell by how I speak. I apparently didn't study English that much. But the point is, I want to know these things. And I was fascinated by this. And... You know, all the time there was God who knows everything and God would share with me what I needed to know and more if I would just listen to him. And it took me a while to get the message. Whatever you're lacking, God has it. God knows. He knew what he wanted to do and he knows all about this. And this is the guy that you're sacrificing. When you worship that guy, when you worship that God, when you sacrifice that God, then you know you're getting somewhere and, and that's why you're thinking about it because he is got it. He knows it. He's there. No one will defeat him. No thing. No, none of that. And this is the God that Samuel answers we'll see down the road. This is the God who's had his hand on all these affairs all from the beginning. Wanting people to follow him, desiring that people would recognize him for who he is and call him who he is and worship him and trust him so he can get you where you need to be. Who is the determiner of your success? He is the definition of success. It's not how much money you have. It's what God wants you to do. That is the measure of success. Family matters. For dads and moms that want to, want to make an impact on their children, take them and introduce them to that God. Worship matters. Giving praise. Thank Him for who He is. For the enormity of His it exceeds all you can imagine. And then make your sacrifice. Sacrifice your, of yourself to him. Say, I will lay down myself, what I want, what I desire, the things, and I will, Lord, I want to know what you want. Now, this is just saying it, don't make it happen. You had to put some feet on it, like I always say. But you got to start somewhere. Isn't it great to know that Samuel's parents started there? That Samuel becomes that person because, part of it because his parents were willing to, to take action and because they worshiped and they sacrificed his dad and that history of that, that lays into Samuel. That applies. And Samuel can look back upon that. Well, I don't know about you this morning, but Samuel's pretty interesting. Uh, I hope that we can hang in there long enough to get it uh, together on it and figure it out. If you'll stick with us, with Lord willing, we'll try to work our way through it. And, uh, and I hope that uh, God speaks to you through that. As he spoke to Samuel, and I hope you'll have that answer when the time comes. Would you pray with me this morning, Heavenly Father? Thank you this morning, Lord, for this opportunity to enter into a new study in your word, a new place to look at. Thank you, Lord, for Samuel and his family. Thank you for this book that we have to study together. Thank you, Lord, for being a big God, a God who's able to accomplish all these things. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and grace that you forgive us as we stumble along, as we've seen here this morning. But we're faithful to you, Lord. You are faithful to us. There's nothing outside of your domain. No matter what the world throws at us, the churches throw at us, whatever happens, whatever direction it comes from, Lord, you're all over it. You already know all about it. You're already ready. I thank you this morning, Lord, for these things and many others. In Jesus' name.